thing, I want to give one more kind of supplemental or qualitative discussion of our rouse and reptation uh, regimes. So way back, again, <laughs> uh, in lecture, uh, basically lecture five, I believe. Let's see. Was it lecture five? Intrinsic viscosity. I believe it was. So let's go all the way back into lecture five. Oh, yeah. Let's go ahead and look at our, yep, the viscosity scaling, uh, Stokes drag, all this good stuff. So way back in lecture five, we were talking about we had these um, freely draining regime and this non-draining regime. So non-draining regime, we had some shielding, basically of solvent or hydrodynamic effects um, from our, uh, basically our monomer would protect some of the other monomers. This kind of, again, hydrodynamic shielding would occur in the freely draining model. Again, that was for elongated polymers. No hydrodynamic shielding. Every monomer interacts with the solvent. So when we're in a polymer melt, there is no solvent. So a chain is basically dissolved in other chains. So uh, a monomer can't distinguish uh, between monomers from the same chain and monomers from the other chains, i.e. Other, other solvent molecules. So if there's no sh uh, basically shielding of these kind of solvent or hydrodynamic, you know, effective solvent interactions, um, the solvent's going to interact with all the monomers. So we are going to be in, uh, basically, when we're in the melt, so just more changes mixing. And again, this whole idea was comes from this log n, log molecular weight. We see these two different scaling, right? So this factor of one up until this critical molecular entanglement weight, and then it shifts to 3.4. And same thing for diffusivity. Uh, molecular weight, and you see minus one, and then minus two slopes. <laughs> Again, at this critical uh, entanglement in molecular weight. So when we're in this kind of first regime, which we call the Rouse, uh, so when our molecular weight is really low versus the reputation, same thing on here, first and second. Um, and again, that molecular weight can be as low as 10, to, usually 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5th. Again, it could be small, pretty small number of repeat units. So for polystyrene, it's about 200 for your number of repeat units. Anyways, um, so we are in the freely draining regime to describe the viscosity in a melt. So if you look back again through lecture 5, we know that, that our viscosity is going to scale with our kind of friction factor, which is this kind of eta of the monomer. And since each monomer feels some of that friction from the fluid or the solvent, and that's there's n number of monomers, so your viscosity is going to scale with n, and n scales with m. So that's how we get this kind of first, you know, that slope, that power law scaling there. Well, that's great, but now we want to figure out, okay, you know, how do we describe essentially the kinetics and the kind of diffusion, um, or actually the diffusion coefficient in this Rouse regime? So what we're doing, what we'll do, and what we, do, what we did previously was just say my diffusivity in the Rouse regime is going to be kT over my friction factor of my chain, which is going to be equal to kT over n a monomer. And you see again, your diffusivity scales 1 over n, and then n scales with molecular weight. So this scales with n to the minus 1. So we're able to kind of recover what we observed uh, experimentally in that first regime. And we can take it one step further and say, let me try to go down here, that my longest relaxation time now is going to be how long it takes to diffuse a distance raised to gyration squared over D Rouse. And we found that that scaling, um, again, you might want to kind of use this expression we saw that it was basically the same as R squared over six. Again, this idea, if we're in um, basically in a theta solvent, this relationship holds well. So remember that your R squared here be equal to C infinity and L squared. So be careful of that uh, kind of relationship and go all the way back into, actually, let's go back into lecture three right now and find that all the way back into our, let's go back into our chemist model. Actually, we we'll had it. Our chemist chain model, way back in lecture three. 
excuse me, fire. Here we go. So you can see here, alpha is going to be equal to one because we're in the melt. So we're left with this nl squared c infinity. So be careful to kind of see how that can uh, scale in an exam. So, but anyways, uh, so and you can see here, so nl squared. So it scales directly with n. So we're going to see that our tau. So let's go ahead and actually write that out over here. Actually, we're going to take it all the way over here. So my raised duration is nl squared. My d of my Rouse is going to be equal to divided by kt times friction factor of monomer times n. So my tau in the my longest relaxation time in the Rouse regime, so tau Rouse is going to scale as n squared. So that's all we get uh, essentially from this relationship. So, but it's an important one to kind of remember. So you calculate that out, and again, it makes sense because in the context of a single polymer chain. It just moves in a viscous solvent of other chains, uh, and we're going to use that freely draining regime to kind of describe uh, there. Now, the key thing here is the diffusion of our chain in the Rouse regime is completely unconstrained. Um, so they act as a viscous solvent, but they don't obstruct the motion. There are no topological or um, permanent um, entanglements or permanent entanglements or obstacles, specifically topological obstacles. So that's kind of the key idea. But as the chains get longer and longer and longer, they're going to increasingly intertwine and form entanglements or topological constraints where the polymers are stuck due to kind of these steric barriers and they can't, effectively they can't move. Now they can eventually disentangle, but we're going to see that that disentanglement time is going to be very, 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 very large. Um, so that's kind of the key idea here. So they're fixed um, and given, uh, again, it's just the chain is going to be diffusing in the presence of these entanglements to avoid the steric hindrance. So again, we can give the example in our live lecture, you're running through a field and then fun suddenly you encounter a forest and you have to kind of move through those kind of fixed obstacles. So those entanglements are kind of represented by this X here and your polymer is going to have to kind of move basically among and change. Its diffusion is going to be kind of constrained because it can't pass through those X's. It has to kind of move around uh, kind of these topological obstacles. One of the good ideas is this, um, the Plinko regime from uh, Plinko, excuse me, from uh, Price's Right. So you kind of see that you know, hitting and banging, and it has to kind of again move around. You can't pass through those forests. You can't pass through those trees. Um, you have to kind of move around those fixed topological obstacles. And so we call this motion reptation. So and then a thing that's more likely to form. Polymer chains are long. Molecular weight is higher. Again, that's where that regime uh, occurs. So there's that threshold where we get that transition from Rouse to Reptation. So we looked at this idea of um, kind of basically motion of a tube. There's a tube of free volume surrounding it. So your polymer can move inside the tube, but really it's going to get to move in one dimension. So inside the tube, we have 1D motion, and then we are going to move until we create a whole new tube, basically topological obstacles. So we're going to move a tube length, which is our contour length, in L. So we're going to move in 1D this kind of entire distance L is equal to our contour length. But our basically center of mass of our polymer is going to move a distance that's equal to our radius of gyration squared. So we, and then this is kind of like a 3D type motion. So when we zoom out and we look at the center of mass motion, that's kind of this three dimensional motion. So again, inside the tube, you know, this free volume, again, surrounding where, again, the position of the constraints inside the tube, it's basically unconstrained. And we could use this Rouse type model. So we uh, looked at, we're invoking kind of this reptation idea that inside of our tube, we're going to look, uh, the diffusion in the tube is going to be Rouse like. It's just KT, eta, mon times, you know, n. And so thus, we're looking at, and we're going to try to uh, figure out what's the time it, or, uh, time it takes, or we want to move a distance, x which is equal to l. So we invoke this idea of this Brownian motion, x squared equals d of tube times tau. We know that x is equal to l, l squared, so l squared equals tube tau, l is equal to nl, so we have 
the diffusion of our tube. So our tau is going to be equal to G2, which you said is KT over E. Uh, actually, excuse me. Our tau is going to be equal to our L squared, which is going to be N squared, N squared L, or capital N, again, N squared L squared, and then divided by KT times E monomer times N. So you can see that your tau is going to scale with M to the 3, or N to the 3. So this is, again, an order of, that, you know, uh, uh, an additional, you know, one value of, you know, in our previous power law scaling for our Rouse relaxation time was uh, basically to the uh, n to the 2. Now we're scaling with n to the 3. So that's going to be a huge uh, discrepancy in terms of the relaxation time. And this is kind of the time that's required in order to um, disentangle. This is kind of the critical disentanglement time. And we could then find essentially your, um, essentially how long your viscosity is going to scale with this. Um, basically this flow time, so that's going to scale with m to 3, and then you could also find the diffusion and reptation regime by just using this kind of relationship previously, which d rep times tau is equal to rg squared. Again, it moves some distance, uh, the ratio of area squared, so your d reptation is going to be equal to, and this is n l squared, approximately. Uh, divided by your tau, which again we said it was n to the third, so their d reputation is going to scale as n to the minus two, which again is the plot that we kind of saw previously. So the key conceptual ideas qualitatively here are when we zoom in uh, inside of the tube, again, run the tube, growing, back the tube, destroyed, volume conservation, um, uh, and then again, a large scale, the tube looks coiled up, navigates in between these obstacles. Inside the tube, 1D motion. Polymers uh, looks pretty elongated. It moves that contour length of that uh, of that tube. Um, so, but we call it. But the the longest relaxation time scale when we completely reconstruct that tube, that is going to be again reflected in this um, uh, again this tau, this longest relaxation time that we calculated previously, where the center of the mass of the chain will travel a distance equal to the radius of gyration right here. So just like in a, man, a random walk. So that time is going to be much longer um, because, again, it has to move the size uh, of that tube, which is the contour length of your material. So it's going to be much larger than the radius of uh, in the Rouse regime. So, again, it should kind of make sense. Um, so the time scale necessary is, is, again, this tau for the reptation, that's the time scale necessary for entanglements to form and then disentangle. So... Uh, this is really, really a critical kind of time scale that you're looking at for polymers. So um, we can look again, uh, figure out the diffusion and the re uh, reptation regime, uh, and then the time again, relaxation time of the polymer. Um, and then again, you connect these kind of ideas, and we see, you know, uh, what were kind of, you know, the two different, you know, huge scaling. For, so tau reptation scales with m to the three, and your tau, your rouse scales as m squared very very big difference again in that you know again and the key idea here topological obstacle constraints here your polymer is just moving through this viscous fluid you know relatively unconstrained so one of the questions you may ask now is um uh because the relaxation time is so much longer than our rotation regime uh and we saw from our deborah number de is equal to tau star over t experimental Relaxation, long relaxation times are characteristic of solids. So are polymer solids in the reptation regime? Well, the question, you know, again, we need to know our experimental time scales, but really, you know, qualified, yes. Um, again, you're going to, uh, basically, as the relaxation time increases, you're going to go from a more viscous fluid-like state to a more solid-like state. Um, but again, we need to see uh, if we're, again, if we're greater than 10, then we're solid. If we're much, much less than 0 one, we're liquid. But in between here, we're in our viscoelastic state. So we need to still see and figure out what is this experimental time scale. Um, but uh, you kind of see that it will, basically, most of the time it'll be viscoelastic, we'll demonstrate both phases. So you'll see kind of this rubbery or this elastic response, um, and then uh, actually you'll see an elastic response even in the absence of physical or chemical crosslinks. Um, but then you'll see kind of, again, this viscous response, depending on, again, 
time scales and uh, the experimental time scales. So um, finally, one last thing uh, and critical idea or one idea here is that um, let's think about we've been thinking primarily about the molecular weight. Uh, actually, we haven't really discussed that in our melts, we could have a polydispersed sample, i.e. a range of probability molecular weights. You could have a range here. So the question then will be, um, okay, if we have some small, pol small polymers and some large polymers, just like we talked about in the previous video, um, what would be the most appropriate molecular weight average to describe the sample? Well, if you have small chains and large chains mixed together, small chains will be in the Rouse regime, much higher diffusion. Again, they are not going to entangle than the large chains. And so the diffusion uh, will be essentially for the small chains instantaneous compared to those large chains. Um, and the diffusion of the large chains will be extremely, will be rate limiting, again, your bottleneck effect. So when you're looking at or trying to describe the, uh, basically the diffusion of a melt that's polydispersed, you want to use the weight average molecular weight. Um, it'll, just, it'll, be, it'll, it'll better describe or better characterize essentially the molecular weight of large polymers in your sample in your rate limiting step. So if you have a large number of, you know, a large, <laughs> large polymers, it's going to move much, 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 much slower. So I hope that kind of additional uh, video, uh, hope this makes sense. Hopefully it clears up a little bit of issues. But again, the key idea here, reputation regime, high molecular weight, permanent fixed top, topological obstacles, and then again, um, know how to do this derivation of relaxation time and diffusion uh, and how viscosity is going to scale and such. Um, so that's the kind of the key idea here. So rotation is a really unique, uh, really unbelievable um, derivation uh, that DeGen and Edwards kind of figured out. Um, and we kind of recovered this, you know, pretty close to our scaling that we were looking at in the beginning of this video. So I hope this helps. And then uh, we're going to get it. Thanks.